Hi, welcome to Tech Talk, a deep dive into today's technology products and services. This is Adult Services Library in my getting at the Hinsdale Public Library, and I'll be your guide. Today we're looking at electric bikes, a category of the market which has really started to gain traction with mainstream consumers. Today, people are really starting to take notice of e-bikes. Several e-bike companies have reported impressive sales gains year over year during the COVID-19 outbreak. People may be looking at ways to avoid public transportation to minimize exposure to the virus. Many consumers are also interested in other modes of transportation besides the automobile. E-bikes are a much greener option than driving, not to mention that they are a ton of fun to ride. People with e-bikes tend to take longer rides than those with traditional bikes. This gives owners the opportunity to get a good amount of exercise despite the assistance from the motor. What are some of the benefits of e-bikes? Well, because you don't have to labor as hard to get up to speed, e-bikes allow you to arrive at your destination without sweat-soaked clothes. This property makes them a real option for many commuters. In addition, they cost significantly less than cars to operate. Your recharging is likely to cost you less than 15 cents a day, even lower, most probably. This doesn't even count parking fees that you can avoid by choosing an e-bike. The fun factor is real. Most riders get a huge grin on their face the first time they try an e-bike. There are also health benefits. As I mentioned before, people tend to ride farther on e-bikes than regular bikes, which gives them a good fitness opportunity. In addition, people with bad knees and backs who previously avoided bike riding find that e-bikes open that world up to them again. There has been an absolute explosion of e-bike companies in the marketplace over the past several years. As a consumer, this means that you will have plenty of choice, which is always a good thing. So what is it like to actually ride an e-bike? Well, in most cases, you will pedal as you normally do, but each pedal stroke has its power magnified by the motor. You won't require as much effort to get up to your cruising speed. Your bike is likely to allow you to select different levels of motor assistance. You'll get everything from no assistance to heavy assistance while you're pedaling. People report that they feel bionic when on the bike. So this assistance that you get will stop at either 20 or 28 miles per hour, depending on how the bike is classified. We'll touch on e-bike classes next. E-bikes are often advertised as being class one, class two, or class three. What does this mean? In class one bikes, the bicycle provides power via pedal assistance, but the assistance stops at 20 miles per hour. Once you hit that limit, you may be able to go faster, but only using your own power. In class two bikes, the bike has a throttle control to provide direct power to the wheel, but only up to 20 miles per hour. In many cases, a throttle bike will let you press a lever on the handlebar at a stop sign to get started. There is no need to pedal at all. I will note though, that most class two bikes also provide pedal assistance. So it's not an all or nothing proposition. Class 3 bikes offer pedal assistance up to 28 miles per hour. You're free to go even faster if you're going downhill or pedaling hard. Confusingly, some bikes marketed as Class 3 may also have a throttle, but in these bikes, the throttle only works up to 20 miles per hour, after which you are restricted to pedal assistance to get up to that top of 28 miles per hour. What are the major components of an e-bike? Well, first there's the motor. This can be located in the hub of one of the wheels. This approach is called hub drive. Alternatively, it will be near the pedals of the bike at the bottom of the frame. This configuration is called mid drive. A hub drive motor is a good general purpose option. They're often cheaper than mid drive motors and can provide a good amount of power. They also tend to be a little more reliable than bin drive motorbikes as the power is delivered directly to the wheel rather than having to go through a traditional set of gearing. Mid drive motors are better at climbing hills and having the weight of the motor at the bottom center of the bike is ideal for stability. Mid drive motors do carry a larger price tag though. 
for writing in Illinois in this area specifically, since there aren't a lot of hills, either of these motor types would do just fine. Next up is the bike's battery. The batteries in these bikes are high tech using lithium technology to get a lot of power per cubic inch. Batteries are pretty heavy, weighing in at five to 10 pounds each. They may be completely built into the frame or they may be removable. Some removable batteries are slickly concealed into the frame so that they appear like a traditional bike. The higher the battery's capacity, the farther the bike will go, all other things being equal. The charger for the bike battery either plugs into the bike itself or into the removable battery. Most chargers will be able to recharge your battery in four to six hours. Inexpensive bikes tend to come with two amp chargers, while more expensive bikes come with three or four amp chargers. The higher the amperage, the shorter the duration of your charging time. The next part of the bike we'll talk about is its drivetrain. This has to do with its gearing system. In hub drive motors, any gears will be found within the hub itself. Some hub drive motors offer just a single gear. In mid-drive motors, you will see the traditional bike gears and derailleur on the rear wheel. By changing gears, you are able to change to a suitable pedaling speed, whether you're going fast or slow. Disc brakes are pretty standard for e-bikes. Low-end bikes will have mechanical disc brakes where you apply all the force with your hand, while higher-end models have hydraulic disc brakes, which require less effort. The brake rotors range in size from 160 millimeters to 180 millimeters in diameter. The larger the rotor, the more stopping power you'll have. This is especially important on the front brakes, which carry the majority of the load when stopping. The frame of the bike is where everything attaches, wheels, battery, motors, gears, seat, and so on. The traditional diamond frame bike is usually an option, as is a lower step-through design. The days of the step-through bike being considered a woman's bike are largely over. Step-through frame options allow you to mount the bike without swinging your leg over the seat. This is a good thing on e-bikes, many of which have racks mounted to the back. The downside of a step-through frame is that structural rigidity is a bit lower, but this isn't normally a problem for most riders. Some bikes include a front suspension. Like the struts and shocks in your car, this helps to absorb the bumps in the road. Electric mountain bikes might even have a rear suspension too. Suspensions add weight to the bike, so they are not without their downsides. If your bike lacks any sort of suspension, or if you would like a still smoother ride on your suspended e-bike, consider a suspension seat post. These usually cost between $150 and $300 and really can make a difference in comfort. Some e-bikes have a throttle, which is much like the gas pedal on your car. If you press harder, the bike goes faster. A bike with a throttle can be a nice add-on to the bike's pedal assist. There are a number of styles of e-bikes. One is certain to be right for how you plan to ride. First up are mountain bikes. These bikes are built ruggedly and are optimized for off-road use, though many people ride them on the road. They tend to have fatter tires than other styles, which have lots of knobs and blocks on them to grip dirt and gravel surfaces. The components tend to be heavy duty and optimized for off-road use. Most, though not all, mountain bikes will come with some sort of suspension. If your mountain bike only has a front suspension, it is descriptively called a hardtail, since the rear is not suspended, but rigid. The next category of e-bikes is the cruiser. These bikes are often stylish and generally comfortable to ride. Because they are more focused on style than performance, cruisers can be heavier than the other types of e-bikes. They are smooth to ride, lacking the aggressive tire tread of mountain bikes. They are capable of being as feature-rich as other types of bikes. These are not necessarily low-end models. The seating position on a cruiser is upright which is great for comfort, but can in introduce more wind drag than a sloping position. The urban or commuter bike is ideal for riding long distances on paved streets. Practicality is paramount. 
These bikes tend to have narrow tires, generally in the range of 2 to 2.5 inches wide. Like the cruiser bike, the tread is not aggressive on these tires, optimized instead for a smooth and quiet ride. Urban and commuter bikes tend to focus on speed and range. Pricier models may have a front suspension, but it's just as likely as not that they'll have no suspension. Relative to other bike styles, these commuter bikes may be somewhat lighter. I will also add that bikes like this often come equipped with a rear rack and front and rear fenders. This increases their practicality as an option for riding to work and making grocery store runs. Folding e-bikes are an intriguing option. They are designed for portability with the frame folding in half to make for a compact package. The folding frame does make the frame significantly less rigid though. This is not a big deal for short rides, like to the train station, for example, but for long rides, you will likely notice frame flex. The smaller frame size of a folding e-bike may make it a poor option for taller riders. And despite being more compact, sometimes these bikes can be actually heavier than the average commuter bike. This may make it less easy on you than you might imagine to take it up the stairs. Individual component quality may suffer in some of these e-bikes as well. Where should I buy my electric bike? Well, there are really three options for purchasing electric bikes. And please note, they don't include big box retailers like Walmart or Target, as the quality of an electric bike sold at these stores may be questionable. The first option is to buy from a local bike store. These stores are staffed with knowledgeable and experienced workers who can help to guide you in your selection process and offer test rides. Perhaps most importantly, they have bike technicians on hand to diagnose and repair any problems you may have. A related option is buying your bike from a local e-bike specialty store. These stores deal exclusively with e-bikes and may be even more keyed into new developments and industry trends in this segment of the biking world. They will, of course, be able to provide you with excellent repair service for your high-tech bike. Another very common option is buying your bike online. The prices on these bikes are lower than buying locally, on average, so bargain shoppers may want to consider this strategy. Typically, these bikes are shipped to you in a large box, and you will need to perform some assembly in order to get it ready to ride. More importantly, you will need to consider the matter of repairs and maintenance. In addition, the warranty on your bike may be parts only and not include labor. Unless you're handy with a wrench, you'll want to find a local bike store willing to work on your model of e-bike. Sometimes they can be resistant to working on e-bikes not purchased from them. Despite the pitfalls of buying online, many riders have purchased bikes using this avenue and have had a good experience. Just go into it with your eyes open. There are countless brands of e-bikes out there, and it can be difficult to know what brands to consider. The brands on this page enjoy a good reputation in the industry. This list is by no means exhaustive, and you can find great bikes from companies not on the list, but it does help to serve as a starting point. Perhaps the best brand option, provided your budget isn't too tight, is to buy from one of the so-called Big Three, Giant, Specialized, or Trek. These bikes feature thoughtful and sleek designs, great dealer networks for support, and good components. Another option is to buy a European brand. Biking culture in Europe is often part of the very social fabric of these countries, so expectations are high for quality there. Look at companies like Reason Mueller, High Bike, and Gazelle, among others. There are plenty of U.S. companies making solid e-bikes, like the popular online brand Rad Power Bikes, as well as Watt Wagons, Pedego, and Aventon. Many of these companies are assembling bikes using components made in China, which also has an enormous e-bike market. When sorting through all of these brands and their various models, I like to use the site electricbikereview.com. You'll get a thorough walkthrough of the bike, including specific details on the components used, as well as a test ride. There's also an online discussion forum if you're looking for information from an engaged biking community. What should you look for when purchasing an e-bike? Well, 
you should decide whether you want a hub drive or a mid drive bike. As mentioned earlier, hub drives require less ongoing maintenance and mid drive bikes are particularly well suited for hills. You should also determine whether you want a class one or two bike, which are limited to 20 miles per hour of assistance, or if you'd like to jump up to a class three model for 28 miles per hour of assistance. Choosing a class three bike doesn't necessarily mean that you plan to spend a lot of your time riding at those speeds, but merely that you will have the option of reaching that speed with the motor helping. You should also keep a motor's torque in mind when choosing an e-bike. This is usually found on the bike specification page on the internet, although if you're shopping locally, the staff should know. Any bike with 50 newton meters or more of torque will accelerate fairly rapidly. Avoid models which have lower than 30 newton meters of torque. You'll also want to know the bike's wattage, which can be a proxy for how fast the bike would go absent class restrictions. Typical wattage is in the ballpark of 250 to 500 watts, though some will go up to 750. In general, higher is better. However, as many of these motors are rated for sale in European countries, which often restrict bike wattage to 250 watts, there's a bit of gaming the system involved. A 250 watt motor may feel just as strong as a 500 watt motor, for example. This is why torque is perhaps a more useful metric of power. Range is a key attribute in choosing between models. In other words, how far can a bike travel on a complete charge? 30 to 40 miles of range is common, but it will depend on how windy it is, how heavy the rider is, and whether you are in an upright or more aerodynamic riding position. Some recent models of e-bikes even offer a supplemental battery to increase the range of the bike. I've mentioned weight a few times today as a factor, with light weight being preferable. This doesn't really come into play much when riding the bike, as the weight of the rider is offset by the motor assistance. It's more important when you are attempting to bring the bike upstairs or lifting the bike onto a trailer. The typical bike weighs in at 55 or 60 pounds, but svelte models can be in the mid 30 pound range, and the heavier bikes can weigh as much as 75 or more pounds. If you know you're gonna store the bike in the garage and won't be lifting it much, a heavy bike won't be a big deal. Of course, you'll also want to consider the ramifications of buying local versus online, which I've already mentioned. How much should you expect to spend on an e-bike? Well, for many people, the issue of price is a big one, especially when it comes to electric bikes. In general, I think that spending in the neighborhood of $3,000 will get you a very capable e-bike that you won't outgrow in a short time. You can find some online bargains in the $1,500 range, but jumping up to $2,500 will get you higher quality components and more often than not, a somewhat lighter bike. Moving up in class to the three dollars to $5,000 bike range will get you a nice bike from one of the big three manufacturers, Giant, Specialized, or Trek. As I mentioned earlier, these brands all have extensive dealer networks across the country. So if you move, you're assured of finding service. Over $5,000 will get you a truly excellent bike with greater performance than lower level models in the brand's product lineup. You'll get better gear systems, larger batteries, and better electric motors. I hesitate to recommend this price category to a new e-bike buyer, unless you are already an experienced bike rider and will appreciate the refinements that higher quality components get you. Wrapping it up. E-bikes are really starting to make a splash in the bike market. They are a great and energy efficient way of getting around town. For many, the fun factor of riding an e-bike is a great reason to buy one, but they also offer opportunities for people to ride who might not ordinarily be able to. The electric assistance makes that big of a difference. When it comes to deciding what to buy, you should give careful thought to what class of bike you want to have. Class one or two for 20 miles per hour assistance, or class three for 28 miles per hour assistance. Choosing the right bike style for you is equally important. Whether you're looking for something off-road capable like a mountain bike, or something comfortable, stylish, and easy to ride like a cruiser. It's also important to buy an e-bike brand that you can trust. If you buy online, make sure in advance that you can find a local shop which is willing to work on that brand unless you are a do-it-yourself sort of owner. 
In short, it's a great time to consider e-bikes as an option, and with a little care with your purchasing decisions, you are likely to end up with something perfect for you. This has been Mike Edding for Tech Talk at the Hinsdale Public Library. Have a great day.